And welcome back. We're here live at the Cosmopolitan Hotel in rainy Las Vegas. Uh, it doesn't rain often, but here it is. When we show up, it starts to rain. That's I don't right. know what that's it's all about. But uh, we're here at uh, .conf 2012, Splunk's user, uh, annual user conference. Uh, I'm Jeff Kelly from Wikibon. I'm joined by Jeff Brick, Silicon Angle, my co-host. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, we're really excited to be here. The day's going fantastic. As Jeff said, it's not only raining, it's huge thunder lightning, so we must be uh, touching on some interesting topics or uh, getting into some, some great places. But we're really excited to have our next guest, David Caruso, with us. As he said, he's the third employee of Splunk. I know a lot of you out there have been at startups. I know a lot of you have been the third employee or the fifth employee or the startup guy. And it's not often that you get a company that's successful and makes it all the way out builds a successful product, has as many happy customers as we've talked to already, and then even gets the IPO, which is you know, kind of a, another process on the journey. Uh, it's not an endpoint, as all my uh, venture capital friends uh, are, are happy to remind me. But not only that, but David literally wrote the book um, on Splunk, and you know, there just aren't that many guys that, that have written a book on a subject. So we're really excited to have you, David. Thank and, you very uh, much. Welcome to theCUBE. Hopefully we'll get you back to theCUBE. Uh, as a frequent visitor. Thank you very so much. So welcome. So, I mean, why don't we just jump out, uh, or jump back to the beginning? Seven years ago, seven and a half years yeah, ago. Yeah. You know, what was it? Where did you come from? Who are these crazy guys that yeah, you decided yeah. to join? Why did you think yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, this might be the one? So, when I interviewed, it was just uh, a few guys at, uh, in, a, in essentially a cubby of the venture capitalist office. So <laughs> it was, we didn't even have our own office. And uh, when I started in uh, February 2005, uh, we had a very small space. We were actually uh, renting a part of six parts office space, and uh, we uh, it was just it was just you know six of us, and we were uh, building a product and we were having a lot of fun doing it. And uh, it uh, it was very you know it was a small team, but a very you know very good team. It had uh, uh, a lot of interesting qualities. The founders are uh, very much. Uh, a part of the success of the company in the, in the sense that one was very concerned about the appearance and the coolness of the factor, one was very open and honest, and one was very brilliant technically in the sense that, so there was this combo, that, that this perfect storm that, that, that made things really come together nicely. And what, and what inspired them? Were they, were they working in a, in a job and there was a challenge that they just, they couldn't overcome because there was no tool, was there? Yeah, so they, uh, they struggled. They they spent two years, uh, basically unemployed, uh, intentionally, uh, looking around for what problems there were in the IT space. Okay. And they interviewed company after company, and basically found a niche that was glaringly untapped. And they went after it. And uh, and that's why we're you know that's having being the right niche is, is, is you know critical obviously right. to the success of your company and, and they found a very good niche that was just completely untapped um, when you talk to system administrators years ago uh, there really was no good tool for this kind of analytics you have uh, thousands of machines or even hundreds of machines and you have a problem on any one of them uh, there were no tools to diagnose things you would have to connect into that box look around on the logs you rep which basically just you know do a text search um, and it was very primitive, and people could spend hours doing these things, and there was just this real untapped need that, that Splunk uh, filled. And uh, with a lot of creativity and uh, uh, hard work, <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, we made it faster and faster and better and better, and uh, it's a really good, scalable tool that, that is useful to, to people outside of the IT department now. Yeah, and when I when I first interviewed, by the way, I, it's an interesting side note. I didn't want to take the call because logs sound boring. <laughs> <laughs> but once they described the problem, it was anything but boring, because there's so many uh, easy problems are not interesting, but hard problems are interesting, and these were all these hard problems that you have to deal with, um, from AI, artificial intelligence, to just good engineering and scalability and understanding your data it was there's just a lot of really hard interesting problems here and and that's what drew me to it cool. why don't you tell us a little bit about your role we've seen uh, your title uh, sometimes as principal scientist I've heard chief mind sure so uh, <laughs> fill us in a little bit about what the chief mind does sure uh, right now I'm in the office of the CTO so mm -hmm. Eric Swan is the CTO and uh, we have a team that basically does special projects and that's a relatively new department uh, Previous to that, I was, uh, you know, uh, in engineering and basically 
building a lot of the, the core part of the data coming in. Mm -hmm. I wrote the search language uh, and um, just just sort of a, a lead engineer working on things. And, and in the office of CTO, uh, I'm working on special projects like the book. <laughs> Love and, the book. And, uh, the book. Um, and different things, building apps to make Splunk more useful. So there's a whole team of brilliant people building the product, but on top of the product, you can build apps that just make it more useful. And there's a whole world of things that you can do. Um, just like a database is a great thing, but there's a world of other things you can put on top of it to make it uh, more useful. Right. Well, let's dig into that, kind of the apps. I mean, we've been uh, you know, covering the big data space for a while at Wikibon, and one of the things right. we're not seeing is a proliferation of big data applications at this point. A lot of work right. in the uh, kind of the plumbing layer, you might say, right. the right. infrastructure, but really kind of that last mile is the application to bring it to the end user. Right. Uh, so tell us about some of the applications you guys are working on. What really excites you? Um, what interests me are, I mean, me personally, are with things like predictive analytics mm -hmm. and, and sentiment analysis. So, so predicting, uh, predicting you know, values in your data, doing, doing, uh, understanding how users feel about your data, uh, um, cleaning your data. There, there's, there's you know, anything to do to, to automate things. Um, finding anomalies automatically. So our core product has a search language but out of the box, you're not finding anomalies is a little bit of an artwork. Right. But to, to build an app to, to help you find anomalies and things like that uh, are, are great. I think part of the problem with apps and big data is monetizing it and, and making it making it making the right uh, place for for modernization and just just the right marketplace. And it's it's not quite there. We're 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 working on it. Yeah. And um, uh, but you know it's growing. It's definitely growing. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're building apps, outside companies are building apps, it's growing, uh, you'd love this massive exponential growth and I could like, you know, love to tell you that they're 10 times more next year. Um, they are growing, but uh, um, yeah, and, and not everybody, you know, people build apps for their own, their own corporation. They right, don't right. necessarily have an interest in, if I work at a corporation, what's my motivation to make it public and right. to help other companies? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. right, so, so yeah, in the big data world, there's some of that community, but there's also some of that, you know, well, part of what we're using these tools and technologies for to kind of for competitive advantage. So you right. don't necessarily want right. to share right. some right. of that right. IP. Right. Right. Yeah, and, and I mean, big data is a, <laughs> is a big advantage. I mean, a few percent between you and your competitor, a couple of years, you're, you're, the, the, you know, you're outgunning them by far. It's the, these big data can add, these small percentages really add up and it's just, it's just critical to companies to, to, uh, to use it. Yeah. You've, got, you've got gold in your data and, and it's being ignored. I like to say that if, uh, if it's plugged in and it's not a coffee pot, it's spitting out data. And even, even coffee pots nowadays. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> coffee know? is the second most traded commodity in the world after oil. So the, actually, I think you need to start tapping into more coffee pots. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And uh, you know, if you look around this room or anywhere, there's just data that's that's being created, right. and you're ignoring it. You know, key card data and data from your phones and data from from every computer, server, cloud, just all over the place. Yeah. And uh, and they're they're being ignored, and there's really useful stuff in them. Um, I, uh, my, my, my kids were late, they had a school trip flying, believe it or not, my kids flew from Vegas back to the Bay Area, they had a trip, uh, it was actually to Zion National Park, but uh, they were late, and you know what I did? I splunked all the FAA data of every flight in the last 30 years. I just stuck, wow. it, stuck it into Splunk, every little flight, how it was delayed, wow. where it went, everything. I go, you know what? You should have known that flight's gonna be delayed. <laughs> that, that flight from LA to San Francisco is historically really, really late. How funny. And, and, and I knew it, you know, and it was just, it, there's so much interesting stuff so out I'm sure there. I'm sure whoever the competitive airlines would have liked to have uh, known that when they put their ticket yeah, on uh, and, and Expedia. And you can see like <laughs> over winter, which, which airports slow down because of the snow and just right. amazing, amazing stuff in there. So I, I want to shift gears a lot. There's so much, so many places we could go. And again, sure. I hope we get you back on the queue, but we talked before we started a little bit about the culture. We talked about 
fr from a startup perspective, so many startups in the valley, and, right. and you know, so many of them unfortunately just don't make it for for a right. whole host of reasons. Right. But you guys did, right. and and you mentioned very specifically, you know, about the culture of the company and the leadership of the company. And we've heard from some other people right. about tremendous uh, things about the leaders, uh, Godfrey, and, and his right. leadership style. And of course, he came in what like kind of halfway through this journey from right. the beginning. So right. if you could expound on that a little bit, you know, what makes those guys special? You know, how do they lead, and how has that really contributed to the success of the sure. company and, and what you guys have going on. We can see it all in the little preview videos of, of the camera walking through the right. offices and it right, looks right. like they're having a good time. So I guess I like to say that, that um, just like your product and your niche is, is critical and not an afterthought to your company and your patents and your strategy are not afterthoughts, the culture of your company shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be, you should engineer the culture to be a place where you want to work, where you want to be there every day. It shouldn't be a place you go to work and then afterwards you go and hang out with your friends. Your friends should be at work. You should want to be there. You'll be more productive. You'll have more fun. You'll be more open. Um, you can criticize your friends. You can't criticize people that are, you're sort of cold and professional with. And so uh, constructive criticism is really how you evolve. Right. It's how your, your product gets better. It's how features get better. Uh, that constructive criticism allows things to, to improve. And if you have this cold professional environment, you don't. So Splunk is a very funny environment. A very, the, the, you know, humor is, a, is just a good metric for, uh, for intelligence as uh, any job interview test. So uh, I, I really encourage companies to, to have a good time while they're making money. <laughs> you don't have, they're not exclusive. They're, 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 they, uh, it's not a coincidence, they go hand in hand. Right, right. So, well, you've been there you know, pretty much from the beginning, so you know, developing that kind of culture when you're a really small, six-person right. organization is one thing, but how do you scale that? Right, so it's an excellent question. We've actually, uh, believe it or not, uh, paid attention to it from almost day one. Uh, every year we have uh, a company meeting and we've had quarterly meetings and sales kickoffs, things like that, and we actually have a session about how do we keep the culture alive? We love working here. How do we keep it like this? Yeah. And so we've actively been, been saying, okay, you know what? We like the beer. Right. <laughs> we right. like the ping pong tables. We like this. We like that. How do we keep it fun? How do we not hire people that will take away our toys? <laughs> right, right. You know? and, um, and, and we've been pretty successful. I wouldn't say 100% successful, but, uh, but we've been pretty good about, about maintaining that culture because we've been aware of it and we've known that this is a precious commodity that, that we wanted to hold on to. Yeah. Um, so I think, think you have to spend some time thinking about the culture you want. Right. And, and, and not, not from a top-down thing. It's a bottom-up. It's a, it's a, it's where do you want to spend your working hours? It's an interesting twist, right? Intel is famous for their constructive criticism, and in fact, they teach classes on constructive criticism, so yeah. you can get in somebody's grill in the meeting, and yeah. and uh, nobody takes offense because we all took the class last week right. in HR. Yeah, and, and you, you, thought, know, you know why you don't need a class if they're your friends? Yeah, <laughs> but but, but you know, you've got disruptive uh, yeah. as one of your core company values. But, but it's disruptive with fun. You know, yeah, as, yeah. as you said, it's a, it's a different way to look at it when you can be disruptive with a real friend because right. you can tell them what you want to tell them because you're not worried about whether right. they're going to take it the wrong way, if they're not going to take it really as constructive when you're both working together to get to a better place. And it's a, Absolutely. That's, a great, that's a great uh, testament on the company. Yeah. So, but of course, you know, there was the, the IPO and that can change things for some companies and not always uh, for the better in terms of culturally. There was an IPO? I believe there was an IPO. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, I must have missed that. Sometime in the that. spring, and uh, so has that put any, uh, you know, when you're dealing with investors uh, on a quarterly basis, it can put some pressure on the type of culture your, your, your company has built. Is that, right, have right. you found that to be the case, and how have you guys dealt with that? Um, a little bit. Uh, not much, a little bit. There, there are, there's a little bit of a tightening about what you can say, what sure. you can, what you should, you know, what you can publicly say, and what you, uh, just, just being a little more careful in terms of the, your public face. So, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put on uh, Facebook, you know, necessarily a really glowing spin on certain things. I would be a little more, a little more cautious on certain. Pub but within the company, I think we're, we're all, uh, we're all good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, 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 I don't think it's put a, a damper on, on the fun. Good. Well, that's good to hear. It's, it, the, the brew is still <laughs> flowing. <laughs> Very nice. So, uh, so looking forward, what are some of the, the exciting things you, you plan to do in the next six, 12 months? I mean, what are, what's your priority list look like? And you know, next year sure. at this conference, when you come join us at theCUBE, what will we be talking about? Sure. Well, 
I'm really excited by a lot of the, 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 the improvements that engineering is doing. Mm -hmm. not, not necessarily me. <laughs> not that I'll be doing good stuff, but they're going to be doing great stuff. They're, uh, the, the speed and, and the, the, the improvements to the product are really, really amazing. I, 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 I've, I've been cautioned not to talk too much about the future, <laughs> but uh, it, it will be impressive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, for my part, I'm going to be building out some more interesting apps and uh, we'll be extending the book. Um, the, the nice thing about this new world of, of, of print on demand is that you can basically uh, send a new PDF and do a version two of the book. So the book. Um, is available on, Amazon, available on Amazon. Available on Amazon.com. But what I'd also <laughs> mention that it's actually free online. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the PDF, Kindle, and iPad version are free. Okay. Uh, we sell software. That's how we make our money. We don't make money on books. So we, we have no interest in, in, in having, you know, we want people to be educated about Splunk. Right. So this is not how we make our money. So uh, the book is free online. It costs money to buy it at Amazon purely because of the paper and the transport. Right. Um, but if you go to splunkbook.com, splunkbook.com, yeah, <laughs> you'll uh, you can find it. And so the book is divided uh, half into basically an introduction to Splunk, how to see the world through the Splunk uh, way of thinking. Great. And the second half is a cookbook, sort of recipes of the most common sort of uh, problems and solutions, right. and how to do them. So it should appeal to the very beginner as well as the intermediate person. Yeah. And, uh, and then hopefully over the year, I'll, I'll be expanding the cookbook. Great, we look forward to that. Yeah, the predictive analytics is interesting because we just had Marquis on before you came on. Right. And he talked about the, the amazing uh, event of, of typing in uh, some search and key phrases and coming back with stuff that he wasn't anticipating, right. but was far more interesting than that which he was looking for in the first place and right. going off down a whole nother track uh, right, of right. value. And, and, and so yeah, yeah. it looks like the pixie dust is right there. You just got to. Yeah. Have it kick out in the first place without him having to, um, to yeah. put it into the search algorithm. I have I have a talk tomorrow on data mining okay. in Splunk, and one of the things I, I emphasize is that people tend to look at Splunk or as any of these products is building you build a dashboard of things you you know you want to see you know the the events per per time or how many web pages I serve per time, but I would encourage people not to limit themselves to that to really explore your data use Splunk as as a an exploratory engine to go and go, well, what about you know, language versus right. IPs versus time versus, how does that compare to last week? There's a whole host of dimensions that you're ignoring because you, you sort of have this a priori uh, belief in, in what's important. Right. But you know what, you're missing these outages. So we, uh, we were once spending uh, an interesting amount of our advertising budget on uh, co countries that didn't speak English. And, uh, <laughs> Data, data, data saved us some money. <laughs> they, the, the people who weren't speaking, re, speaking English weren't, weren't buying the product right, surprisingly right. because our website was in English. And uh, so <laughs> um, there's, there's a lot of gold in that data sure. and, and you got to pay attention to it and uh, you need to explore. Yeah, you need some kind of I feel lucky button and just you know keep hitting the button and it keeps spinning the dials. Here we are. In we don't. Vegas we don't have. We don't have the. Uh, it comes back. Oh, here's a relationship. I had yeah, absolutely no clue that these four factors correlated yeah. in some interesting way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have it to that level yet, but that would be that would be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Fantastic. Well, we're here live at .conf, Splunk's annual user conference in Las Vegas. Uh, we've been speaking with David Caruso, principal scientist, chief mind, just all around good guy. <laughs> That's Splunk. Thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. Thanks, uh, thanks again. We really do appreciate it, and we'll be right back with our uh, next guest.